This is the first lecture of the set series. So uh, I think we'll start. And without further ado, I give the platform to my colleague, Visurikiti Nayaka, to deliver the welcome speech. Visuri. Yes, Dan. Uh, thank you. Um, good evening to everyone. Do you? It is, can you hear me? Yes. Sir. Can you hear me? Yes, Mrs. Kitina. Yes, yes, go, go ahead. Okay. Um, good evening. Good evening to everyone. It is my pleasure to deliver this welcome speech at the outset of the annual guest lecture series 2020 organized by the Physical Society of University of Peradeniya. First of all, we'd like to welcome Dr. Varuni Senviratna, the head, Department of Physics, and dear lecturers. Also, a special welcome to our guest speaker today, Dr. Dimitri Kahanda. We, as the Physical Society, are pleased to have you all at the first lecture of the guest lecture series organized by the Physical Society of University of Peradeniya. We couldn't have pulled off this event without the kind help from Varuni Madam, our head, Department of Physics, and also the patron of Physical Society. Next, I would like to, uh, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. P. W. S. K. Bandaranaika, the Senior Treasurer of Physical Society, for his kind guidance and support. Also, I'd like to warmly welcome all the lecturers, demonstrators, fourth year physics special batch, and my dear friends who worked hard to make today's event a reality. We, as the members of Physical Society, would also like to welcome all the first year and second year students who are participating at this event. At this moment, I would like to invite all the students to join with us to follow this virtual talk series. I sincerely hope that today's talk will inspire all of us. Next, I would like to say a few words about the guest speaker for today, Dr. Dimitri Kahanda. She is the product of our faculty, the Faculty of Science, University of Peradeniya. Currently, she is attached to William Marsh Rice University in Texas as a postdoctoral scholar. She is going to talk about her PhD research work and more specifically on DNA-based electrochemical devices to track anti-cancer drug activity. I'm sure the annual guest lecture series 2020 will bring out many new things in the field of physics. So I welcome you all once again to the guest talk and hope you all will have a great time ahead. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Suri. Well, uh, if Suri introduced our guest lecturer a bit and I'm sure our students would like to know a little bit more about our guest lecturer before she starts the lecture. So I call upon Dr. Bandar Naika to give a small introduction about our guest lecturer today. Sir. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Today, our guest lecturer is Dr. Dimitri Kahanda at Rice University, USA. Dimitri obtained BSc physics special degree from University of Peradeniya in 2011. Then she joined the University of Texas at Dallas, USA, as a graduate student. She also worked as a teaching assistant for five years during her studies. She completed PhD in physics in 2017 under the supervision of Dr. Johnson Slinker. As the PhD project, she developed bioelectronic devices that can track anti-cancer drug activity and helicase interaction with DNA. 
Dr. Dimitri Kahanda is currently working as a postdoctoral scholar at Rice University in the research group of Dr. Anatoly Kolomeisky. Her current research is on developing theoretical models to understand how mismatch repair proteins interact with DNA. She was also one of the faculty members who organized the NSF-funded undergraduate summer research program at Rice University in 2019 and 2020. Now I cordially invite Dr. Dimitri Kahanda to deliver the first guest lecture organized by the Physical Society of the Department of Physics, University of Peradine. Now, Dr. Dimitri, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction, Dr. Bandaranaika. And thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this uh, guest lecture series. Uh, I hope you can all hear me well. Can you hear me well? Uh, yes, Dr. Yes. yes, madam. So I will try to share my screen with you so I can share the presentation. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, so, <clears throat> so today I'm going to present you some of the research work that I did as a graduate student in my PhD. I thought this uh, project is more appropriate to present to you uh, to see as physicists how uh, we can think about uh, contributing towards healthcare and um, medicine. So today's talk is uh, on DNA acylochemical devices to track anti-cancer drug activity. Before going into the details of the, the talk, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just trying to get the laser pointer for you. So yes, today, uh, so before going to the details of how the device was designed, I would like to go through some fundamental details on uh, what we know about cancer and what treatments are available for cancer patients and what are the difficulties that we face as scientists in developing cancer treatments. So if you look at what a cancer is, it is uh, known as a device caused by uncontrollable cell division of abnormal or malignant cells and the spread of these malignant cells to the surrounding tissue. If you're not familiar with what cell division is, it is a normal process in every or organism that we see that a parent cell divides into two or more daughter cells. And this is a necessary functionality of the survival of any organism. And all the information that is necessary for these uh, cells to divide is usually recorded in the genetic information stored in the DNA. And um, usually if there is a certain mutation or a certain uh, wrong information recorded in the DNA strand that will lead to giving uh, malignant or abnormal cells. And uh, it will also change the cell division information recorded in the, D uh, the DNA, uh, which will lead to unnecessary cell division. And these uh, divided cells will have uncontrollable um, 
situation where it will lead to a cancer. So almost all the mutations in DNA has the tendency to lead to a cancer, but usually if the mutation or the abnormality is smaller, the, the cell has the capacity to control that uh, mutation and either get rid of that unnecessary cell or change the mutation before it leads to a cancer. Um, so to know a little about DNA, because as you can see that mutations in DNA leads to cancer potentially, it's uh, important for us to understand how the DNA is made and what uh, important aspects will lead towards the cancer. So DNA is composed of three uh, important components. One is the phosphate group. Second is the monosaccharide sugar group. For, uh, third is uh, one of the four nitrogenous bases recognizes adenine, thiamine, guanine, and cytosine. Adenine always pairs up with thiamine, making two hydrogen bonds, and cytosine pairs up with guanine, making three hydrogen bonds. If uh, there is a mutation in the DNA, uh, like a base, these are called nitrogen bases, and a base substitution where uh, cytosine is replacing a thiamine, they cannot make the, the correct number of hydrogen bonds within each other that lead to mutation that can potentially lead to a cancer. And there could be base substitutions, base additions that will actually potentially make a frame shift on the DNA, meaning that all the uh, bases in here cannot line up with its corresponding complementary strand, leading uh, potentially leading to a mutation in the DNA. So these are common uh, causes of cancer, which uh, are you might be familiar with already. And 33% is caused from tobacco, leading to lung cancer. And there's a large portion from excess weight or obesity. And there are other known factors as uh, genetic, family history, alcohol, and any viruses that we're exposed to. And still there is 11% of unknown factors that are causing cancer. And also it's important for us to recognize that there are different types of cancer depending on the organ that they start and the type of the cell that the cancer starts. And breast, liver, stomach, colorectal, lung cancers are recognized as the most lethal cancers in 2020 and about 1.8 million people are affected with cancer all around the world. And from them, one third has not survived. And there are different types of treatments that are available for cancer. Surgery, radiation therapy are a few of the common methods that you use in a less lethal cancer. And uh, depending on the type that you can, uh, depending on the type and where the cancer had progressed, we can use the other types of uh, treatments, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, hormone therapy, where you can target the cancer and uh, uh, different medications have been developed for this cancer. And even we have these number of types of uh, treatments for cancer, it's still really hard to decide the physicians and the scientists what works very best for each person. Uh, the, so when the physicians are de deciding a uh, treatment, they have to look into what type of cancer it is and the stage and the progression of the cancer and age and other medical conditions of the, the patient and also which side effects each of these methods will cause and how we have to uh, look at risk over benefits in deciding each treatment for each patient. And with that, I would like to go to some of the difficulties that the scientists actually face when they are developing a drug or a, a chemical that can be used as a, a cancer treatment. Uh, it's really difficult for the scientists to decide which 
medication works best because we have to always uh, think about the different conditions and different situations of the patient at the same time different side effects that will affect them and when we are um, using certain medications especially for younger generations we have to think that they are growing and they need lesser side effects and they face very different difficulties depending on the person. And also uh, you must be familiar that in science, we use a number of animals to, uh, testing and we dedicate a number of uh, small animals for these testings. And if sci as scientists, if we can think of methods to reduce this, that will be uh, very uh, useful. And also there is uh, excessive amount of money and time dedicated for uh, developing these cancer treatments. And uh, we can think of what are the ways uh, in, uh, in device designs that we can think about of uh, minimizing all these uh, drawbacks. So with that, I would like to go to the uh, motivation of the design of this device is to think about a platform or a bioelectronic device that can be developed to uh, make more personalized uh, treatments that is um, appropriate for each patient. At the same time, it can potentially reduce the amount of clinical trials using mice and other animals. And also it saves time when especially using bioelectronic devices, the signals are very fast and reliable. So if we can think about a, a platform uh, that we can um, combine all these, uh, that will be uh, very useful. So, so before going to, into uh, the de device that we design, I thought that it will be appropriate for you to recognize what are bioelectronic devices in general. So in general, a bioelectronic device is the integration of a biomolecule with a certain electronic element in, uh, on the purpose of either making a useful device in order to sense a certain biological functionality or uh, to make certain chemical, hydrogen, nitrogen, ammonia, or uh, uh, some useful chemical out of these biomolecules. So it has uh, main four components, the biomolecule of interest that we want to study, and another enzyme or another biomolecule that attach these biomolecules to the bioelectronic device, which are not producing significant signals corresponding to uh, the comparable to the biological molecule itself. And we need a method or a technique that what sort of a, a signal that we are looking at, it could be electrochemical, optical, thermal, or piezoelectric, and there could be many more. And also we need a, a good a signal input output system that can actually uh, apply a certain signal and see what sort of a signal change that it makes on this uh, surface and also records that and so we can visualize that. So uh, some of the common uh, bioelectronic devices that are already uh, in healthcare are one of the main common ones is the glucose uh, glucometer that can measure the amount of glucose in our blood through a drop of blood. And also there's a tooth enamel biosensors that are designed that goes in your teeth that can measure the amount of nutrition a certain patient is taking or the different medi medications that they are uh, taking. And also um, the contact lens biosensors can actually record different conditions of the patient from the tears in their um, uh, eyes. And you can also use this as a glucometer. And there's sweat mi uh, microfluidic devices that can measure different condition, conditions of a person from uh, the sweat that they're producing. They can also record external and internal uh, information that the patient is exposed to. And in bioelectronic medicine, there are uh, some interesting uh, things that they have already discovered, just like this uh, nerve healing 
a device where you can actually place this device in a, a nerve and it will start regenerating the nerves. And this is a biodegradable, biocompatible device. So you don't have to uh, retract it. You can let it be in the uh, muscle and uh, let it uh, degrade by itself. And there are uh, some uh, bandages that has been um, uh, developed that actually have a certain level of uh, medication in them and they can be released uh, within the time that we want, and this will potentially heal the wound that a certain person has. So with that, I want to go into the device that we design. So I will go into details on how each of the components are designed later, but I thought one of the most important things about designing device, designing this device, and also gaining a uh, very efficient data from this device is done by mimicking or copying certain aspects of a biological cell from our device. So we have two main components in our device. One is the nucleus area, which is representing this whole area in our device. And we also have a cytoplasm area uh, that is corresponding to this smaller area, which is in here. And you can see this sieve kind of area where only certain molecules can go through that actually represents the nuclear membrane. Only certain proteins and enzymes can pass through this and reach the nucleus area, just like that we really see in a normal cell. And this was important for us to, um, uh, build our device in this way so that we can get very uh, efficient data. Um, so going from that, um, as I explained, this is a DNA-based device and I want to point out why it is a DNA-based device and what are the benefits of having DNA on the surface. For one thing that I, as I explained earlier, that uh, cancers do happen uh, at the level of DNA and any mutation or, or change in the DNA strand leads to a cancer, can potentially leads to a cancer. And also DNA can be understood as a molecular wire in biology. So the hydrogen bonds uh, that you see in the middle of the DNA actually makes an overlapping pi orbital a uh, pathway for the electrons to pass through the DNA, which leads uh, it to be a molecular wire. So you can, so the DNA we use uh, is in one side uh, modified with a redox molecular probe that you can understand this uh, DNA as a light bulb, which is the redox probe attached to a outlet, current outlet. The DNA is just like the wire between them if you have a good connection or a good wire between the light and the outlet, you can see the, the bulb can light up. But if you have some disconnection between them, the light, the bulb cannot light up. Just like that in the DNA, if you have a very good uh, connection between these nitrogenous bases, there is efficient transport of electrons from an electrode surface through to a redox molecule that uh, potentially leads the molecule to reduce or oxidize. But if you do not have a good connection between them, you can see a reduction in that current. So this is uh, basically the idea behind this uh, device that we are using for our purposes. So now I'll explain how this uh, electrode surface where you, we have the DNA is actually designed. So these uh, devices are one inch by one inch devices that are designed in our clean rooms. If you're not familiar with what a clean room is, it is a laboratory, but a little more advanced laboratory where you have very least amount of contamination from smaller particles. They have dropped the particle levels up to 0.3 micromolar. So there won't be any dust or any particles surrounding us. And the people who are working in the laboratories will be uh, wearing these protective uh, clothing to make sure that our devices are clean and not contaminated. 
the smaller circles, the smaller 16 circles that you see on the surface are uh, the electrode surfaces where we have our DNA. And um, this device is designed in a way we start with a silicon wafer, which has a small oxide layer. And we deposit the gold uh, pattern on that surface, which you see here. And we also have another photoresist to make sure that each of these gold electrode surfaces are not connected. So uh, starting with the base, this is the base of the device. And on the top of that, we have a plastic uh, like a system where we can uh, conveniently introduce the necessary proteins and enzymes that can actually interact with the surface. And we also have the white part is the cytoplasm corresponding to the cytoplasm of the cell, which is shown in here in this way. And um, this is the side view of the device. You have the device and you have the clamp system, which is shown in here in white and the, the white compartment where it introduced the cytoplasm. And these uh, 16 uh, squares actually goes into contacting uh, into uh, the input output signaling system, which is uh, separately where we can visualize uh, our signals that has been applied at the same time, what of a sort of output signal that we are seeing. So um, I will roughly go through the preparations of the DNA, which were done in our labs. So these smaller DNA, as I explained before, are modified in one side with a redox molecule known as Nile blue, and the other side with a thiol linker, which is necessary for it to bind to the gold surface. And we use self-assembly for this DNA uh, to bind to the uh, gold surface, and this DNA is purified, characterized, and quantified in the in the labs. And when we are receiving the DNA, we actually receive them in single strands, and we have to make sure that we thermally anneal them to make one single DNA, and then we can self-assemble them on the surface. So the to go into details on what is the technique that we use or the, what is the signal outputting um, technique that we use in this uh, experiments is um, that we are using square wave voltmetry. I think you are familiar with the square wave. It's like a square wave, but in square wave voltmetry, it's a square wave embedded with a staircase. So it's actually gradually increasing. At the same time, it uh, shows as a square wave. So the reason that why we are using a square wave voltmetry in uh, an experiment like this is that it actually reduces the amount of background currents and unnecessary signals from the surrounding. So what we do in these experiments is apply this timely changing potential between two electrodes. The two electrodes are the working electrode, which is the gold surface and the reference electrode, which is actually immersed in the solution in here inside the clamp system. And once we apply this potential, what we do is then read the current output between the counter electrode, which is also immersed in the uh, solution and the working electrode, which is actually the surface that we have the DNA. And if you have a uh, certain redox molecules reducing oxidizing on the surface, this is the type of a signal that you observe. So uh, at a certain potential, you can see a peak corresponding to a redox species on the surface. And this is a very um, unique peak to that specific uh, reducing oxidizing species. And also another important aspect in our experiment is that the height of this peak is actually uh, directly proportional to the number of reducing or oxidizing species on the surface. So we can quantitatively say how many or how many species have been reduced or oxidized. At the same time, we can watch uh, how much has um, uh, how much 
has uh, faced a certain issue into um, not being able to reduce or oxidize due to, due to the environmental condition changes. So how to use uh, our devices to recognize uh, small uh, DNA repair uh, sensing recognition uh, sequence is that in this way I can uh, explain to you that on the surface we have the DNA and uh, think about that the DNA has a certain mutation or a change which is a, a double bonded oxygen that is unnecessarily there in the DNA and think about this FPG is a, a repair protein that actually repairs the protein, uh, repairs the DNA in a way that it actually uh, cuts off this double bonded oxygen from the DNA, leaving a gap in the DNA. So if we look at the, the electrochemical signaling that we uh, inserted into the system before and after introducing this FPG glycosylase protein, we can clearly see there's a reduction of the signal because when there is a gap in the DNA, there cannot be any efficient electron passing through across the DNA to the redox molecule. Hence, it reduces the amount of uh, signal that you see from the square wave voltammetric current versus uh, voltage signals. And on usually when we are doing experiment, we have in one side uh, where, where we are looking how the signal drops and the other side we have a control system where we do not have the DNA damage. In that case, it, the FPG cannot cleave the DNA. In that case, there won't be any change in the electrochemical signal that we see. So we usually compare the signal between the, the active side and the control side and see how much a signal has dropped comparatively. So moving with that, what uh, we use uh, in our devices is that in one side we have the control on damaged DNA and one side we have the damaged DNA. And from the current versus voltage signals, what we observe is this kind of a signal drop. When we have no uh, FPG proteins on the system, we will see a signal like this. And with the introduction of the system that uh, on the side that we have the, um, the DNA damage, we can potentially see a signal drop uh, on the redox peak. And we can measure this the height of this peak and quantitatively say how much of reduction of the peak has occurred. And moving with that knowledge to looking, uh, uh, looking into uh, cancer uh, killing drugs that we decide to work with uh, UT Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, one of the professors uh, known as Dr. Budman was at that time working uh, on this drug known as beta lapocon and he, had, he was studying it under clinical trials using mice and trying to understand how effective this is. So we joined with them to see how effective our devices are to see whether we can study about this um, medication. So to, to explain to you uh, in short how this uh, drug actually works is that it actually has the capability to selectively kill cancer cells uh, compared to uh, killing normal cells. So what it focuses on in a cell is that known as this NQO1 enzyme. NQO1 is an enzyme that has the capability to uh, detoxify or uh, reduce certain uh, quinones into their hydroquinones. But the difference between uh, NQ1 presence in a normal cell to a compared cell, a normal cell to a cancer cell, is that in a cancer cell, you find this NQ1 enzyme thousand times higher than a normal cell. So this, uh, the if we are selectively looking at a pathway through that we are focusing on an enzyme that is abundantly present in a cancer cell that is called selective um, uh, anti-selective anti-cancer cells, anti-cancer drugs. So in this pathway, what happens is that this beta-lapocon actually um, uh, 
it drags with NQ1 and it produces uh, its corresponding hydroquinone that potentially has the capability to uh, go back to its uh, original beta lopicon form. And in this process, it produces a large amount of reactive oxygen species that can potentially uh, kill the cancer cells. So moving with that, once uh, the, the beta lapicon produces a large amount of reactive oxygen species, that it can produce a large amount of DNA damage that actually uh, in turn overactivates the repair activity of the cell that potentially leads to the uh, death of the cell. So uh, two important things that are uh, mentioned in here is the catalase and the reactive oxygen species. And catalase is one of those enzymes that you find in normal cells and cancer cells that has the capability to uh, get rid of reactive oxygen species by decomposing them into water and uh, water. And so the important thing that we had recognized uh, the existence of catalase in cancer cells versus normal cells is in uh, cancer cells, we uh, find the levels of catalase is very lower. So the impact of that on reactive oxygen species is pretty low. So if, if it's hard for you to understand this pathway, what you can understand the bottom line of this beta-lapicon drug is that it can selectively kill cancer cells and leaving the normal cells surrounding it uh, intact. So how do we use our devices to study this cancer uh, beating uh, drugs is that uh, we have two sides where we have one side, we introduce the drug and on the other side, we have the control side where we don't have, we don't introduce the drug, but all the other components that are necessary for the drug to be activated will be introduced into that side. So on the side that we have beta lapicon it will potentially uh, make a large amount of uh, DNA damage on the surface. And once we introduce this FPG glycosylase proteins that can potentially uh, repair the uh, DNA, it will actually cleave the DNA in a way that it uh, leaves a gap in the DNA, which reduces the current that passes through the DNA to the redox molecule. And that we can recognize from the electrochemical signaling. On the side, we have the uh, control. We don't have beta lepicon, but all the other components necessary for the drug to activate, which are usually defined in a normal cell. So it's info, uh, important for us to understand how much of a signal change that they could cause even without the beta lepicon. So we can comparatively see how much of a good signal loss has happened. So in the out of output from current versus voltage, what we see on the side of the drug is that we start with a good uh, redox peak. And in the presence of the drug, we can clearly see that the peak height has reduced. And we can uh, qualitatively say that how much the peak height has reduced. And side, we have the control. We don't have a significant change in the signal drop, but we still have small portion of the signal drop due to um, unnecessary binding of the proteins and enzymes with the DNA. So we have to make sure when we are comparing or recognizing the signal loss that we are looking at the side where we don't have the drug. And looking to the concentration dependence of the drug that we were introducing to the system, we could clearly see two point, uh, at 2.5 micromolar uh, concentration of the beta lepicon, we could see a, a huge signal loss, uh, which is actually uh, very comparable with the data which was produced by the clinical trials. And for them, 2.5 was the least amount of dose that they can give to those cells. But with our devices, we were fortunately lucky enough to see a significant signal drop due to one and 0.1 micromolar concentrations. And also we were able to see a significant uh, change in the signal loss due to uh, 
the amount of NQO1 to catalase ratio that we find in a cancer cell versus a normal cell, which was very significant for us to see and understand that the catalase have very least um, impact on the signals that we were uh, producing from our devices. And also moving with this, uh, we also recognize that we can actually use actual uh, lysates. If you're not familiar with lysates R, it is actually, uh, first you, uh, in clinical uh, trials, you usually grow the cancer in mice or any other animals, and then you can extract the necessary cells uh, that has grown a cancer uh, to study about the proteins, enzymes, and other activity of the cell. So working with uh, the medical schools, we were able to obtain the nuclear and cytoplasm lysates from real cancer cells and introduce them into our devices. This was really important because in our first steps, uh, if you remember, we were introducing each component, each uh, molecule separately. And in, when we're introducing a lysate, it will also have other enzymes and proteins present in the system, which are abundantly and has the capability to mess with your signal. So, and also for the signals and uh, the devices to function properly and to understand how well our devices work in understanding these anti-cancer drugs, it was important for us to use this uh, lysates from nuclear and cytoplasms. And we could clearly see a very good signal loss where we have uh, our cancer cell lysates versus uh, non-cancer cell uh, lysates. And we also checked with the catalase levels compared to uh, cancer cell versus normal cells. And dichomoral is another chemical that can inhibit or stop the activity of NQO1, which is very necessary for the uh, selective cancer killing of uh, our drug. So in the presence of uh, dichomoral, we could see that there was a, no, a significant change in the signal, meaning that uh, it, it could potentially lead to uh, the stopping of the cancer if it's necessary. Um, with that, so this is a very uh, bio-heavy uh, page where we actually obtained from the clinical trials from the, la the labs in the medical school, which I will uh, roughly tell you that this is a Western blot where you can look at the presence of each enzyme of proteins uh, that you find in a cell. So NQ1 is the enzyme that is necessary for the activity of this uh, anti-cancer drug. And you can uh, abundantly see that in uh, the cells that you have the cancer compared to the cells that you don't have the cancer. And alpha tablin is a, a standard uh, enzyme that they use to see that is abundantly found both in cancers and non-cancer cells. So uh, any drug that is actually focusing on this enzyme would not work. That's why it is important uh, for the development of these drugs especially in uh, focusing on uh, working with the NQO1 enzymes. And this side is a viability assay where you look at how many cells have survived when you uh, uh, introduce uh, different concentrations of this drug. So uh, you extract the cells from um, a mice or another uh, animal testing uh, set up and you introduce the drug and see how much have survived at each concentration. And from this curve that they have realized at 2.5 micromolar concentrations, uh, uh, at least 50% of the cells have died due to the beta lapicon. So that would be the point that they will consider as the most effective, the, the, uh, the effective point that the drug should be used uh, in uh, humans. So 2.5 micromolar was observed and recognized as the little dose for the cancer cells from clinical trials from the medical schools. And from uh, this is important for us to recognize because from our devices, we want to see whether we can also see that 
kind of a lethal dose and we could recognize that 2.5 micromolar concentration was actually corresponding to the point or the, the point of signal loss where we can see a plateau of the signal on our devices. That means that when we are introducing a 2.5 micromolar concentration to our devices that is actually uh, actually reaching a highest point in um, highest point in the uh, signal loss uh, in our devices. And from here, what you see is that also that it is also con corresponding to the 50% cell death fraction that you see from the viability assays from the previous uh, page that I showed you. Okay, with that, so how to think about actually using this uh, to test different drugs is that we have to design a device where it is currently actually done in the lab with uh, the other graduate students who are working right now in the lab. And you have to uh, de uh, develop this device where it can test different drugs in the same platform in the same time. At the same time, we should be able to introduce different patient samples or cell lysates that are uh, matching the conditions of different patients so that we can see which drug works better for each patient. And it could be maybe one drug could be working better, it could be few drugs working better, but the reading, the amount of time that ta takes to make one reading is few seconds. So if we can develop this to test uh, thousands of drugs at the same time, we can recognize which drugs works very well for each patient. And uh, since the time is running out, I'll roughly say we also use these devices to study about these helicase proteins. Helicase proteins are actually necessary of, for functionality of DNA where it can actually unzip the DNA and we could see a corresponding signal loss uh, from our devices uh, corresponding to helicase activity. So not only that we can study about anti-cancer drugs, but also mainly this device can be used to study about uh, fundamental uh, properties of uh, DNA and how they function, how they interact with proteins. And um, as we see, we can think of uh, the functions and their mechanisms by which these proteins interact with DNA. Yeah, with that, actually, I'll go to the summary where we were able to develop uh, devices that can track anti-cancer drug activity successfully. Uh, one of the reasons for successfulness is that we try to match certain aspects of a cell with our devices. And also the data that we found from our devices were very comparable with the clinical trials that has been happening. And also uh, these signals were reliable, reproducible, and also uh, fast signaling. And not only that, these devices were tracking anti-cancer drug activity, we could also study about other DNA interactions using the, these devices. So uh, these are some of the publications uh, that I uh, helped with these devices. And if you're interested, you can find them in Google Scholar. Or if you don't have access, I, uh, you can always email me. I can share them with you. And with that, I want to thank uh, my PhD advisor, Dr. Jason Slinker, and the lab members, uh, Mark and Chris, who helped me along this way and our collaborators, Dr. David Bootman, who actually unfortunately passed away last year due to heart attack and Dr. Lee Fan, uh, that we collaborated in uh, obtaining uh, the necessary information, knowledge, and also the, the clinical trial results. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I am happy to take uh, any questions that you have. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, madam. Well, I know everyone will agree that the lecture was very informative and uh, it was presented in a way so that all of us could understand, even people without a big bio background like me. So I thank you again. And like madam said, uh, we will be moving on to a small Q&A session question and answer session now. 
So, uh, if our lecturers uh, have any questions to ask from our guest lecturer, uh, now is the chance. Uh, and after that, our students can ask any questions that they have. Awesome. Thank you. I hope it's clear. It was. Um, I tried to make it clear as possible, and I apologize if something was not clear to you. No matter, it was very clear. So, uh, Dr. Varunas and Ratnaram, if Dr. Kahanda, I have a small question. Uh, yes. Um, you started as a physicist and then I'm sure you have learned a lot of biology, uh, mm -hmm. but then uh, in designing this experiment and uh, everything, uh, I mean, uh, what your contribution as a physicist, um, mm -hmm. so uh, can you explain that? Yes. Uh, yes. So um, I, th I think you're familiar with um, uh, certain aspects in biology by now that uh, as undergraduates, we get a little bit exposure to biology and biophysics. I took Dr. Shivakumar's uh, biophysics and medical physics classes and I understood how much that I'm interested in, in studying about them. And there is a gap between um, thinking about bioelectronic devices, especially uh, designing them because biology is a very vast field and the people who are experts in them kind of have a little time to spend on understanding how a device works and, and the uh, interaction between a biomolecule and device is a little difficult to get. So there are biologists who are working, biologists and biochemists who are interested in that field, who are getting into that but we can see more of physicists and chemists who are interested in developing these devices, having that background, how the materials work, how uh, the electrons work, and uh, how each of these components work, that what we had to fill is that gap in biology to uh, see how we can contribute. But I think coming from a physics background, it gave me more opportunity uh, to understand uh, the physics behind biology and the necessary um, aspects that is uh, important to understand them. Especially if you look at the DNA, the how the, uh, the current passes or the electrons that passes through the DNA is through quantum tunneling. So certain uh, phenomena mm. like that is new to <coughs> biology. The interest in studying about that is little rare compared to this physicist. So I think that was one of the reasons more physicists are getting into um, bioelectronic devices and myself. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from our lecturers? Uh, um, yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Siyakuma. Can you hear me? Yes, do you think? yes sir. Yes. Yeah, glad to hear. I mean, uh, after a long time. Yes. Um, how do you manage to uh, convince these people who are doing in the imaging side? I mean, uh, they are the people who convince the, uh, the, the drug companies. Um, that's a good question. So we are actually <laughs> currently, um, not me, my advisor, PhD advisor is uh, connecting with the Johnson's and Johnson's. They are also developing different devices. Yeah. And uh, the, one of the reasons that we wanted to work with uh, a few of the doctors and uh, medical school uh, expertise is that for us to make sure that our devices work well, as well as the clinical trials. So that kind of have that compatibility between them so it is easy to convince uh, people who are actually working or in developing drugs to think about uh, developing these devices too. So if we only think about a new drug and study about that and we don't have clinical trials and using mice and other animal testing, this would not really be successful. All right. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yeah. I want to ask one thing, um, Dimitri, uh, that is uh, when like this DNA, uh, since I don't know much about the biology, uh, do mm -hmm. you have to conduct the experiment at a low temperature or is it possible to do at room temperature? Uh, so these were done at room temperatures. Mm -hmm. uh, at these levels, yes. So that's a very good question. So these drugs were luckily working at a room temperature, but there could be other drugs which are going through different pathways and focusing on different enzymes, which are not really stable. But um, we have to think about only the drugs which are uh, working at room temperature because the body temperature is anyway higher. Mm -hmm. than room temperature. So we are focusing on the, those drugs that mm -hmm. are effective at room temperature. Yeah, I think I, I was more concerned about this DNA once it is like taken out of the body and whether they survive and all that so because i don't know much biology and that is the question rather than the drug i kind of realized that they should work at a higher temperature the drug but the dna yeah. i was not sure whether they will survive uh, once it yeah. is taken out of the yeah body. they do uh, they do survive because uh -huh. they have to survive at 36 celsius oh okay okay so like in our body yes yeah okay. so then those chips, uh, if I ask you, uh, the especially that uh, field effect transistors that showed you, that you showed yeah. the, like the ones that are used in the biosensors, like uh -huh. glucose sensors and all that. Uh, uh, suppose uh, that work is from others because you, you, you cited some references. Uh -huh. uh, but then did you also use uh, that kind of... Uh, uh, JFET uh, in your electrochemical cell that you showed there? Um, so in this work, it was uh, just, a, just a very simple Three device. Mm -hmm. We have yeah, a layer of gold, but uh, mm -hmm. I did collaborate with the lab where they use field effect transistors to see that the bridging is the DNA that you can study the current passing through DNA. So uh, using uh, transistor-like system, which is very complicated to okay. say, yes. <laughs> okay, yes. thank you. Um, yes. Usually when there's a biomolecule and a material, there's various number of issues that we run into, especially that they degrade on the surface. So we have to make sure the environment or the buffer solution surrounding those molecules uh, does match the needs of that biomolecule. So one of the very big difficulties is recognizing and understanding those uh, needs. Thank you. You're welcome. Excuse me, madam. Yes. Uh, this is a very little question uh, just popped in my mind. Uh, since we are talking about uh, devices, uh, mm -hmm. that works with elect electricity, uh, how can we power them uh, with the power source? Where is the power source? Yes, um, so the power source is usually outside. Let me see whether I can bring you, um, probably not. So uh, I think it might be a good idea to show you the slide where we have the whole system, yeah. So the power source is outside actually, I haven't shown it. So all these wires goes and connects to, connects to a power source where we can apply the potential into these, uh, through these connections. And uh, it is like a, a potential stat, a box where uh, you can control the potential and the type of the potential square wave, cycl cyclic voltammetry or just a linear uh, potential that you are applying and you through the computer you can take read out of uh, what a current that it's producing okay madam uh, a little thing uh, can't we just use uh, the electricity that made in our body uh, i know that uh, there has a in brain we use electricity to uh, pass the signals here and there mm -hmm. yes um 
Yeah, that, so that's a good question. Actually, in, in our bodies, we do have electricity. That is one of the main reasons I think we could make these devices, but uh, those electricity, uh, people do study about this electricity and, uh, but people have very hard time in uh, like taking a read out those electricity, especially they have designed some very thin devices that you can even can go to your brain and they put it on your brain that can read those signals. Uh, but it's a, a little very tedious uh, thing to do and you had to be very careful with not damaging the cells. So that's one of the reasons that you would design a device outside of the body. But those are also under uh, studies right now on studying the amount of electricity and what sort of changes that they make inside our body. Thank you very much, madam. Madam, uh, just I want to know that uh, uh, nowadays uh, cancer patients uh, are having. Uh, hello. Yes, yes, I can hear yeah, you. Uh, cancer patients are having uh, more than one uh, type of cancers, like uh, mm -hmm. breast cancer and skin cancer, etc. So, uh, as we are using a DNA to uh, test the. Uh, drug activity. Uh, so, if someone is having uh, more than one cancer, how this can be used? I mean, yes, DNA is changing and all those things. Yes, that's a good question. So, you can see that this is actually at a very basic level uh, in developing a device. And I, I explained in the last slides that uh, right now in the lab, <clears throat> They're preparing that platform that you can test several drugs at the same time, and you can introduce different conditions and different uh, types of cell lysates from different uh, cancer itself. So think about a patient who has three different cancers, and we can introduce, we have to um, potentially extract those cancer cells from them and introduce those lysates to this device and then introduce different types of drugs and see which drug works better for them for each different uh, cancer. So this is actually uh, at a very um, fundamental level. Right now, I would say designing the device, we already overcome so many issues in studying uh, only a few of the drugs with these devices, but hopefully in the future that this would be helpful to uh, study and understand what type of um, cancer drugs, anti-cancer drugs are more effective for each person and each type of cancer. Thank you, madam. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, if anybody has questions and have problems with their, with their connections or anything, y'all can drop a message in the chat box and I'm pretty sure Madam will be happy to answer those questions as well. Uh, if anybody is having any connection issues, just drop a message uh, in the chat box, yeah. Yes, and also uh, you can share my email address with everyone if they need to um reach out to me and i'm i'm more than happy to talk more research or about uh, applying for graduate schools or anything that you are interested in yes. hearing about uh, excuse me yes excuse me yes, yes. Uh, so i'm a first year student i'm doing biological science uh, in the university of Pennsylvania. as we have heard that uh, the cancers are occurred due to the uh, particular mutation in some cells. So, uh, so that mutation caused to the cancer. So then cells grow up in another way. Uh, that mm -hmm. is not stored in that place. 
case. So can we uh, remove, replace that gene, that mutant gene with the, uh, the original gene in order to get that, get the cure from that disease? Like, is um, there a way to do that? I think you're talking about kind of like synthetic biology where you can replace the wrong gene from the uh, the DNA strand that actually uh, that makes the mutation again and again, right? So there are actually yes. So there are some studies right now going uh, happening, uh, especially in the United States, on replacing that uh, mutated gene. Um, but as I think you're familiar with uh, the difficulties of uh, changing uh, a gene. From, especially from a human being that goes through uh, various number of ethical issues because <clears throat> certain when we are removing certain genes, if you are not careful, we might be uh, affecting the other genes which are necessary for the functionality of that human being that can potentially lead to other various uh, issues with that uh, person. So those studies are happening around the world and uh, scientists are very careful to uh, make sure that uh, their work is precise and correct to before applying actually to a human being because we have to be very careful when we are uh, changing a gene especially yes i hope that answered your question thank you very much Mary. yeah sure Excuse me, madam. Yes. Why you use a clean room for that? That's a good question. So <clears throat> uh, smaller particles, like uh, think about a dust particle, which is flying around. And if we uh, unfortunately get that on the surface of our device, it will actually uh, interact with, or it will actually change the surface structure that will not give us a good uh, self-assembled monolayer of DNA on the surface. And also it can um, make a loose connection between these electrodes. These are very small uh, devices. We have to make sure that they are very clean uh, because within a cell, they have the control for that to have the least contamination. But when we are making a device, we have to make sure that we can match with the necessary uh, components of a real cell. So we have to reduce the amount of contaminants as much as possible. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Uh, is there any way to uh, to get some uh, more details about this device? I mean, that uh, kind of a website or something. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you can get some of the information from uh, the the publications that we have from our lab. So. I, I'm not quite sure that you have access to the biosensors and bioelectronic publications, which I am more than happy to share with you. And also you can uh, learn about this from different labs who are working on this project. You can search for DNA bioelectronic devices or ele DNA electrochemical devices. And um, also, I think I will be able to share some of the web pages with you if I can get an email. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. I think, uh, Dimitri, in that case, uh, maybe Physical Society president can uh, email you and get the publications, and uh, probably uh, maybe we can share it. Uh, in our website, I'll check that. Okay, if it is possible, like yeah. I mean, at least for a week or so, we can keep. If we can keep, um, or otherwise, uh, I will see what how. I mean, maybe you can send it to physical society president, or um, I'm, yes, I can. Share that. We will see how we can share that with students who need this. Uh... Okay. Yes.
So any other questions? Uh, this will be kind of the last chance to ask questions about the lecture or subject matters. Anybody would ask any question? Uh, madam, uh, I want to know that uh, when uh, people get uh, treatments on cancer, uh, after there are side effects uh, which get from uh, various drugs. So mm -hmm. is this, um, these devices are uh, helpful to check uh, whether uh, are there any side effects on genes or I mean the DNAs after a long time from the, these drugs? That is a very good question. I think uh, a lot of scientists are studying about these side effects, which are uh, one of the hardest things uh, with the, all of the medication that has been developed. So yeah. to a certain extent, we can test uh, the side effects at the level of mutations on the DNA and unnecessary interactions with the DNA and um, uh, unnecessary interactions with other proteins through these devices. But that's true that when it comes to a higher level, even these devices are not uh, good enough to do that. So uh, unfortunately that uh, the, the necessity of a clinical trial or the necessity of using uh, animal studies is uh, hard to for us to beat because at the end you need to uh, get the drug to a certain animal that has certain level of similarity with our cells to make sure that uh, in long term what are those effects but potentially uh, I think devices can be developed but in order to do that we have to understand how a biological cell works very well at the same time as an organ or a tissue, how much uh, that uh, affects a, a drug, a certain drug can affect the whole organ or the tissue at the human being itself. The whole system, how it is affected needs to be studied. And I am pretty sure it's going to take quite a lot of time. Thank you, Mayor, for your answer. So I have some questions in here. I will try to uh, answer them. How the concentration gradient in the semi-permeable membrane is maintained to transport only the selected molecules? Yeah, that's a good question. So in our device, uh, what we want is certain molecules to pass through this, uh, the semi-permeable membrane to reach the nucleus. And these molecules are uh, have a molecular weight, which are very small compared to the other large enzymes and proteins which are inside the, uh, the that cup. So it and gives that uh, efficiency for the small molecules to pass through the membrane effectively. And also um, we didn't have to worry about a, a concentration gradient because we do not have uh, in the beginning any of these uh, smaller molecules uh, inside the nucleus area. So uh, there is zero to one ratio. So all the mole smaller molecules can pass through to find the nuclear area. Uh, normally, anti-cancer drug treatment period is alternated with uh, rest periods. What is the reason for that? Uh, oh, okay. So I think what you mean is uh, anti-cancer drug treatments are, um, that's one of the alternatives from the other method. So yes. So I think with uh, cancers, the first thing that they, try to do is to remove those malignant cells from the area as much as possible. So they go for surgery or any radiation therapy to trying to remove that. That's the first step. But even removing that would not work sometimes, unfortunately. And when it comes to that level, they have to think about other methods of controlling the cancer and selectively killing the cancer and selectively finding the cancer cells uh, everywhere in the body because the cancer could spread into different places. So if you have to open the body to remove the cancer from different places, that's not effective and that also can uh, impact the other organs in our body. So 
those are the times that they have to think about a medication to uh, treat cancer. Uh, do anti-cancer drugs work only during a specific stage of the cell cycle? Yes, so that's a good question. So these are actually um, certain, there are uh, specific um, medication that are developed to focus on a specific stage of cell cycle, but these can be effective at any stage, the drugs that we have, because uh, once you have a cancer uh, malignant cell, it will have this uh, proportion of NQ1 levels higher in the cancer cells compared to normal cell higher at every stage. So you can uh, selectively kill the cancer cells at every stage. But yes, there are several uh, other drugs that actually focuses on a certain specific uh, stage of a cell cycle. Um, what is the technique used uh, to fabricate the device? Is it photolith? Yes, that's true. That's correct. So we use uh, photolithography to get the pattern on the device and also e-beam evaporation to get the gold and also titanium addition layer and the photoresist. Uh, photoresist is like a spun on the surface. So yes, that's how we design the device. <laughs> Playing some credit. Thank you for sharing the uh, email addresses. Um, I will be happy to share the publications with you at the same time, more information. Yes. I think there's some connection problem with uh, Pavitra as a... Uh, yes, uh, I think there's like a small okay. delay, but I think it's good right now, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If there's a question, you can uh, drop in the chat box as well, uh, if there's a problem with the connection. I think there was a problem with his connection. Uh, so uh, if then like uh, if that's it, if there are no other questions, shall we conclude the question and answer session? Yeah, it seems like it. Then, uh, well, uh, thank you so much, madam, for the invaluable insight. And I'm pretty sure a lot of us learned a lot of things here. And uh, well, uh, as all things come to an end, uh, we would uh, wrap up our first guest lecture. And to thank you properly and to thank everybody who helped us uh, host this event, we would like, I would like to call upon my colleague, Sadiq Jayatilaka, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dihan. Uh, it's a great honor to me to express a word of thanks in such an event like this. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our guest, Dr. Dimitri Kahandal, postdoctoral scholar at Rice University, for from her BC schedule and receiving and sharing a bit of her vast knowledge with us about DNA-based electrochemical devices. Uh, truly, it was a very lively lecture about an interesting subject. Uh, thank you very much, madam, for your thought-provoking and interesting address. Uh, next, I would like to thank our patron, head of the physics department, uh, Dr. Varmi Senevratna, and senior lecturer of the physics department, senior treasurer of the physical society, Dr. P.W.S.K. Pandarnayaka, uh, for the guidance they gave 
in organizing this event. Uh, I sincerely thank all the lecturers of our physics department for their guidance and support in this event. Uh, I would also like to thank my colleagues, members of the Physical Society uh, of the University of Peradeniya uh, for their fullest cooperation in organizing uh, to make this event a grand success. Uh, I thank all the demonstrators for their presence and cooperation in this event, your presence mean to us. Uh, finally, I would like to thank all the colleagues who have turned up for this event, online event in such great numbers, not only from our department, rather also from other departments and faculties. Uh, thank you all for your presence uh, and I hope you may gain a meaningful knowledge from this event. Uh, thank you all. Yes, uh, thank you, Sajid. Well, we have reached the end of our event. And also please note that the recording of this lecture, uh, the whole thing is uploaded in the YouTube channel of the Fiscal Society. And the link for it is uh, shared in the chat. Yeah, there you go. So um, I'm pretty sure you all gained a lot of luck from this lecture. So please share the YouTube uh, link as well so others can have the same benefit. Uh, people, I'm sure they wanted to join and they had problems with the connection due to these weather conditions and all. So they can uh, go to the link and uh, have like uh, get this lecture for themselves as well uh, and get this opportunity. Well, I think uh, we'll wrap it up here. So wish you all a good day. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you have a good day too. Yeah.